We're just going to take a little bit of time to focus on the idea of the church and to ask ourselves the question, what is the church? I think this is another one of those sort of tool sessions. So it's not designed to be a full theology of the church, but just to help you engage a little bit with church. I think even within the people in this room, as you guys have come in, everyone has a perception of church. The word church over the course of history has often been used. It's abused. The church has given itself at times a good name and an honourable name, but at times as well a very shameful name. And lots of things have been done in the name of the church, which means that in our day and age and in our generation, um, when you when you mention the word church to someone, they've got a very different picture of what the church is. So I think my challenge today is to help explain what the Bible says that the church is, because it's easy to base your experience of church and your understanding of church of what you've experienced when you've walked in some church doors Uh, but I think the the challenge is that the church because it is God's people we actually need to understand a little bit about what Jesus said the church is what the Bible says the church is because if we can understand that then we can move towards creating that community and creating that environment that I think the Bible always envisioned so have an open mind whatever you think about what the church is start again you might think it's some sort of chapel You might think of walking in and having a boring experience sitting on some pews. Perhaps you've been to a church before and perhaps you've been abused by the church. Perhaps you've been used by the church. Perhaps you've had a bad experience with people in the church. And yet I think none of that is what the Bible says the church can and should be. And if we can understand and if we we can commit to saying, you know what, I want to know what the church should look like, then I believe that's the first step in actually moving in that direction. So come at this with an open heart as we think about the church, as we think about what the church is, and hopefully we can just learn a little bit about um, who who Jesus said the church was and then what our part is to play today. So the church actually comes the first time Jesus talks about the church. Jesus is talking about um, himself. He's explaining who he is and what he does. Um, And he's just gone through the, who do you say I am? He's asking his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus responds to that with something quite interesting. Firstly, he says that flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. So it's a divine revelation, Jesus is saying. You've understood something. But then Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the first time we actually see Jesus using this concept of church. He's speaking to a person, and he's saying, on you, based on you, as a rock, I'm going to build my church. The church was Jesus's idea, and I think that's important for us to grasp. The church was not something that was sort of invented in the third century AD or invented by a group of people that were saying, okay, well, now we've understood who Jesus is. We should probably, you know, come up with something, an institution, uh, something that means that we can get together. No, no, Jesus was the one that started. He instituted what the church was. In fact, the Greek word used for church is the word ecclesia, which actually just literally just means the called out ones. Now, that's not talking about anyone special or anyone that's like super qualified. It's just basically saying the called out ones are the ones that Jesus has called out. But of course, we know from Jesus's message that Jesus came for everyone. He came for humanity. He came to save the world. So for those that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they become those called out ones that Jesus was calling to. So basically anyone, as they become a Christian, you become part of the church. And that's something to think about and ponder on. What does it actually mean? Now I'm a part of the church. It's sometimes a big mental shift for people to move away from the idea that the church is the building to the church is the people of God. And so starting right from the beginning with what the Bible says, we can actually start to build a new picture of perhaps what the church is, one that's so distant from what society would present it today. The formation of the church is actually described in the Bible. There's a book called The Acts of the Apostles, or Acts for short. And through that book, we actually learn about what the formation of the church looked like. You see, Jesus had died and risen from the dead, but then he ascended into heaven. And after he ascended into heaven, he said to the disciples, look, I'm going to give you a gift that's going to help you now outwork this witness to the rest of the world, to all of the Gentiles, basically people that weren't Jews, that hadn't yet understood what the message of Jesus was. And that gift was the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, through the work of the Holy Spirit, you are now going to build and form this church. And in the book of Acts, right at the beginning, in chapter two, we read this. We read that the disciples devoted themselves to four things, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And it says that awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all of those who believed were together, and they had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and their belongings, and they were bringing it all and basically pooling it. And it says, day by day, attending the temple and breaking bread together in their homes, they received their food with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And it says that the Lord then added to their number daily, those who are being saved. And it's a beautiful picture. It's a very simple picture of what the church looks like. You see a group of people coming together around a common purpose. They're sharing their lives together. They're in community together. 
They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, so to the word of God. They're devoting themselves to prayer. Sometimes they're going together and meeting in the temple, so a large gathering, and other times they're meeting together in people's homes. It's actually a really attractive image, and I think if we can understand what the church really is, it's an attractive concept. And so today, when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about any sort of building. We're not talking about an institution. We're not talking about something political. We're actually trying to define this group of people that are a group of believers that have a common purpose, that decide to be generous with their lives, to live in community with each other, to share their lives with the people around them, and to do it all the while while praising God and to making sure that there is no unmet need amongst the community. So the idea of what the church is hasn't actually changed. I think it's so fascinating that as this community got together and praised God, the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. It was an attractive community. It was a community that had both large and small gatherings. And that's what we try and do in church today. We meet on a Sundays and it's a big gathering. It's a group of a whole load of people. Sometimes you may have walked into a church on a Sunday and felt like this just seems like a crowd to me. But actually it's just two sides of the same coin. There's a crowd on Sunday, but the church doesn't stop on Monday. The church actually continues. It's a community. And that's why you then see that out of the big gathering, you also have small gatherings. It's Christians, it's believers meeting together in homes. Even people that aren't yet in faith, it's being invited into the community, accepted into the community. As you read through Acts, you realize that this was a community that was led by God. It was a generous community. It was a community that saw the miracles and the wonders of God, the healings of God. But at the same time, it was a people that were generous, that accepted people, that reached out to the oppressed, reached out to the marginalized. Descriptions of the church don't actually stop there in the Bible. And as we read on, and especially through the Apostle Paul's letters, the Apostle Paul, who was basically, he was a man that was originally persecuted the church, got saved, got radically saved, and ended up really being an advocate for the gospel and for the church. He wrote a whole load of letters to the different churches. And in these letters, he often describes what the church looks like, because of course he is helping these new believers, these people that have just understood the gospel for the first time. He's helping them now understand what their next step is. Because if it was all just about just accepting the gospel and being like, okay, I believe it now, then what next? What is it about the rest of our lives? What do we do with the rest of our lives if it's just about accepting a message? But of course, Paul helps us understand that, yes, we accept the message, but that's the beginning of the journey. After that point, we're now called into this community, and it's a community with a purpose. I love at the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, Paul just writes this little bit about the church, and I'm going to read from what's called the message translation, which is a guy called Eugene Peterson, who I think has amazingly captured the heart of what Paul was trying to say. He says in Ephesians 1 that at the center of everything, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. The church, he says, is Christ's body in which Christ speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. You realize that the church is so much more than just a group of people meeting together. It is, in fact, the vehicle through which Jesus shows himself to the world. You see, because Jesus was God, there's no single person on this planet today that can fully express who God is to the rest of the world. There are no other heroes other than Jesus in the Christian faith. But instead, Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to show who I am through a community, through a community of individuals that might never have come into a community with each other, a community of people that have different gifts, that have different loves, different strengths and different weaknesses. Jesus says, all of this is going to build a picture. And this picture is going to be of who I am. And the world is going to see this picture and it's going to be such an attractive picture. It's going to be a picture of love and a picture of acceptance, a picture where anyone can walk in and be loved for who they are and helped along their journey of growing to know God more. And I think this is why the idea of the body comes into play. And it's not the only time that Paul uses this picture of the body. Indeed, when he's writing to the Corinthian church as well, he says, now you are the body of Christ and you are individually members of it. And what he's saying is that each of us is like a part in the body. No part of the body is more important than another. Parts may be smaller than others, but that makes them no less valuable. So there's something, I read an article about how if you lost your little toe or something, your balance would be completely out. And it's similar to that. There's, there's, bodies, there's parts of the body which are on show, and there are other parts of the body that aren't on show. And yet if you were to take any one of them away, the body would suddenly not function as well as it does. And this is a picture of the church. All of us come with different gifts. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit empowers each of us with different gifts. We don't all have the same gift. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. But when these gifts come together, they act like a body. They build this community whereby my strength is your weakness and your strength is my weakness. But together we start to build this picture. We start to build up this body. That's why it's a place of acceptance because it doesn't matter what your gift is. It doesn't matter what you're strong in or weak in. We actually understand that every part of the body is valuable. 
All, all people's gifts are valuable, but no one gift is more important than any other. Like even sometimes you look at church and you say, well, the person on the platform or the person speaking, they must have a more important gift. But that's just saying like, my arm is visible, so that must therefore be the most important part. But actually when it comes to the body, of course, some of the internal parts, some of the unseen parts are the most important parts of the body. The heart, the lungs, the stomach. And it's the same with the church. So if you can understand that the church is not only a community, it's a community where everyone is welcome, it's a community where everyone is gifted, it's a community where everyone has a part to play. You see, as I mentioned, the church isn't just meant to be a group of people that stands stagnant, that just sort of enjoys each other, other's company, but that's it. No, no. The church has a mission. Jesus gave the church a purpose. And that purpose was to be a, to a, a witness to humanity of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And that's what the church is there for. So it doesn't matter if it's meeting in a chapel. It doesn't matter if it's a group of people meeting in a theatre or out on a field. Or perhaps it's a few people meeting together in a home. If the essence of their gathering is love, if the centre of their gathering is Jesus, they're acting as the church. If their mission is to just step out and say, you know what, we want to help more people understand the love of Jesus Christ, to be a demonstration of who Christ is, then we are being the church. And so if you're thinking, OK, well, how, how do I engage with the church? What does it mean to be a part of the church? Well, there's no special magic to it. There's no special formula to it. As I mentioned before, the Bible says that pretty much when you accept Jesus as your Lord, of Savior, Lord and Savior, you now become a part of the church. You're part of God's called out once. You've made a decision to be reconciled to God. You're now part of the church. And so the only thing that remains is for you to engage with the church. You need to be aware that the church isn't perfect. Why not? Because it's made up of people and no people are perfect. There'll be people in church that you get on with really well and people in church that you get on with really badly. There'll be people in church that annoy you more than anything else. But ultimately, church is a family. And in the same way as there's going to be times when your brothers and your sisters and your family annoy you, there's going to be people in church that annoy you, people that offend you. But if we can understand that the church is not perfect, but actually it's this community of people that is desperately just trying to know who Jesus is more and to demonstrate him better to the world, then suddenly we find a space where everyone is accepted, where we can have grace for each other, where we can bear with each other's faults, we can forgive each other, we can demonstrate the kingdom of God in such an easy and accessible way. And I promise you, when the church does that properly, it becomes an attractive place to be. It becomes a place that people that don't know Jesus look at and say, why are they different? When the church argues with each other, it's not a place that people look at and say, I want to be a part of that. And Jesus as well, when he's speaking about the church, he emphasizes unity. And he says part of the church is unity. Of course, there's going to be differences in opinion, but unity is not the same as conformity. We don't all have to be the same to be unified. We become unified around the message of Jesus and we become desperate to say, okay, we want to provide a space where people can come where people can do their journey together, where they can learn more about who Jesus is, they can understand who God is, and then they can reflect that into whatever sphere of influence they're in, whether it's their family, their friends, their work colleagues. Actually, if we can be a demonstration of Christ, that is what the church is there to be. This one body, this unified body, no one thinking they're more important than anyone else, no one being valued more than anyone else, but realizing that actually in front of Jesus, we are all equal. And therefore, we are going to be a reflection of that to the world. If you can get that, if you can understand with that, then I think the next step for you is just engage with the church. Step into what the church is. Walk into a church gathering. Meet some people in the church. Join a small group in a home. Do whatever it takes to start engaging with the people of the church, realizing that your part is valuable, that you've got a place in the church, that you are accepted in God's house. When God talks about the church, when the Bible, sorry, talks about the church as well, he says it is his house. It's like a home. And so when you're part of the church, it's like you are creating a home for others to walk into. It's not a hotel, it's a home. A hotel, we walk in, we do what we want with the towel, we leave the, uh, I don't know, leave the dressing gown on the floor when we leave, whatever. We don't value it as our own. But in the church, we're encouraged, no, no, when you're a part of it, we all help, we all serve each other. We, t we treat this as our home. And if you can get that, if you can keep open-minded, if you can allow people to offend you and forgive them, if you can realize that this is just about a group of people trying to show Jesus off to the world, then I think you'll have a pretty good understanding as to what the church is.